Yeah. So on today, we're going to um, start a series of sermons um, from the book of 1 Corinthians. And we're going to be in 1 Corinthians for the rest of the year. Um, or until we finish 1 Corinthians. We, uh, I thought I was, uh, well, just, just until we finish it, we'll be in 1 Corinthians, all right? Uh, so go ahead and, and start reading through 1 Corinthians. Pull out your commentaries, whatever books you have. Um, there will be, we'll be able to go into more and in greater detail on Wednesday nights. As a matter of fact, we have prayer service at 6 p.m. Yeah, and Bible study at 7. We've been having a great time in, our, in the Word on, on Wednesday evenings. Um, and so, um, uh, we're going to start today in, in 1 Corinthians, and the passage was already read for us. There, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 1 through 3. And of course, I step up here and everything goes away. Uh, but you have your Bibles already open, so uh, let's, let's, um, let's begin to look at this and what God would have for us to uh, receive from his word on, on today. All right. Um, and the title of this, this series is um, Church or Culture. Which side are you on? Church or culture, which side are you on? Um, and the title of today's sermon, um, what in the world is going on? All right, Lord. Oh, goodness gracious. All right. Uh-huh. All right. I hope y'all are praying. Yes. Cause my grandma would say, the devil is a liar. And we're going to keep him at just as that, because that's all he is, is a liar. Hmm. Very interesting. All right. Sweet Holy Spirit. Well, I'll just follow the text. So we're in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And the word of the Lord says this. Paul called to be an apostle of, of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. Um, and call to be holy together with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from our God and Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The title of our sermon is, is it up there? Yes, God's grace over our mess. God's grace over our mess. Just 10 things I want to lift up from this passage this morning uh, to put on the altar of your heart. We're going to get out of the way. I'm just joking. All right. Uh, God's grace over our mess. You may ask, we'll say, Mac, why did you title it God's grace over our mess? I'm glad you asked. When we look at this city of Corinth, one of the great themes of 1 Corinthians is the display of God's grace. God's grace is displayed over Corinth because in a minute we're going to see how jacked up Corinth as a city was. Yet Paul, when he addresses Corinth, he never talks down to them. He's always talking to them in an accountability voice, but he never diminishes who they are as God's people. Corinth is, this, this particular time period is about 18 years after Jesus um, ascended into heaven. And so this church is around uh, 100 to 150 members. Yet when Paul addresses them, he does not 
condemn them, but he speaks about God's grace over them. This church is, has partnered with the culture in so many ways as we will see as we progress in this. Yet Paul does not demonize the church. He encourages them. And in verses 2 and 3, we're going to see specifically how he encourages them in the midst of them being just as chaotic as the culture. Hmm, quite interesting. We'll be all right. I'll make it. Thank you, Kenzie. See, look at them younger. They're trying to help the old man out. I greatly appreciate it. So put down in your notes Acts chapter 18. Go to Acts chapter 18, verses 9, uh, 9 through 11. In that passage, you will see that Paul did not want to be in Corinth. Corinth was such a jacked up city. Even Paul, the apostle, did not want to go there. It's in the third century um, that scholars even say in describing Paul that he was a man that had a physical, uh, had physical issues. Some say that Paul had, a, had an eyesight problem. But Paul is described as a man with a hook nose. Paul is described as a man that his, his, his legs were bent, they were broken. They say Paul even had his eyebrows met in the middle. Paul was not the kind of guy that you would think God would use, yet Paul was called by God. He had to deal with his own uh, inhibitions, his own fears of going to Corinth, because Corinth was such a jacked up city. They even called Corinth uh, that, that, a place where you go that you cannot afford to even go through. And we'll talk about why. But Paul didn't necessarily want to go there, so Paul had to deal with the things in his etern internally, and he also had to deal with things relationally because he was not necessarily approved by eyesight of people. Yet, God called him. Amen. First point, if you will, write this down, is that uh, because of grace, uh, I am called. Paul is called to be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. You hear I didn't? Give the first point, I am called to be an apostle because I don't want anybody to walk in and think that you've been called to be an apostle because you have not. But you have been called by God for a specific and particular reason. And if Paul was willing to work through what he looked like, and if he was willing to work through um, the, his identity crisis particularly because of what he had going on internally, we must be willing to work with our idiosyncrasies. Because all of us have been called. Now listen, if you have accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, there is another calling on your life. There's a call to salvation. There's a call for all of us to discipleship. And then there's a call for whatever God, however God has wired you and gifted you, for you to use that wiring and gifting for a specific purpose. And if we're not doing it, we are not living all of our salvation in God. Because we have been, we are being saved for a purpose. All right, all right. So if you don't mind, let's, let's make this an interactive service. Ask somebody you didn't ride with, are you pursuing your call? Look at somebody, look at somebody. Look at somebody, are you pursuing your call? Now, whatever they say, if they say no, ask them why not? Ask him, what's the hold up? Look, ask him, what's the hold up? Listen, the reality is we know that if we don't do something, God has a remnant. He has a ram in the bush. But why would we lean on a ram knowing that God has called and saved us? Why would I put off my responsibility on somebody else knowing that God has made a specific selection of me? Now, you can talk yourself out of it all you want to, but you're missing out on what God wants to do in and through you. Paul didn't look the part. He was smart in the head, but they even said that Paul had a, a different way of talking. Everybody didn't like the way he talked. He, some people are just so smart, they're just dumb. You know what I mean? But I'm not saying Paul was dumb, but Paul was just a smart guy, and they, people had problems listening to Paul. Yet Paul used the gifting God gave him because the text says that Paul knew his assignment. He was a messenger of the gospel. Yeah. Listen, maybe many of us got to sell our hips long enough to ask God, God, what is the assignment for my life? 
As a matter of fact, let's not placate. Many of us know what our gifts and talents are, and then we got to ask ourselves the question, why am I not using them? For God's glory. You, you know, because we, we, could, we could pass the mic around. Everybody said, well, this, I'm gifted to do this. Well, well what, are you doing for the, what are you doing for the kingdom? I didn't say what you're doing for the church. What are you doing for the kingdom? Come on, come on. All right. Say back at me, I am called. Now, if you know you're called, we've got to be about the Father's business. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes. There are going to be some names that we're going to address in this series. That some We may have heard, not heard some of these names before. We'll dig into a little bit deeper on Wednesday night to give some background on these people. Just know that Sosthenes is known to be Paul's scribe. He's one of the ones that walked with Paul. Again, it's been said and written that Paul had an eyesight problem. So Paul was not the best writer because he couldn't see well. So Sosthenes is one that walked with Paul, and he was, he was his scribe. So God not only has made a calling of us, God has called some people to support us. Uh, but you will never know who's there to support you until you start doing the call. You see, people are not drawn to you. They're drawn to the calling in you. And if you have people that are drawn to you, that means they, there's a different kind of situation going on. No, there are people that God has planted here on this earth that are drawn to the calling on your life. And they're there in your world to aid you in that specific task. But if you're not doing what God's called you to do, you just think everybody's there to help you. And some folks are there to hurt you. So look at what he said. He said, I'm an apostle. What I want to talk real quickly is that the apostleship, we do not have apostles as like Paul or Peter anymore. Let's be clear about that. We dealt with this um, in the last series uh, a little bit that there are, there are two different ideas of apostles. One is apostleship that's not active today, and that is like Paul and Peter. But we do have apostleship in the way of a system and order that there are men and, who organize systems so they give leadership to systems in the realm of religion. And so we call them, give them, they give them the title of apostle. But be very clear that no man or woman functions in the idea of apostleship as was in the days of antiquity. That day is over. All right? All right? All right? All right? Everybody good with that? If you're not good, we'll deal with that on Wednesday. All right? So just know that I am called. And here's the reality for you today. If you don't adhere to the calling on your life, you don't know how much more life you will have to live. For God has not called us for sit, to sit down and twiddle our thumbs. God has called us for a specific purpose. And if you're like me and I'm like you, we want to do God's bidding. Old saints say, get in a hurry and do it now. As we continue on in the passage, we not only are we, uh, do we um, have God's grace, and because of his grace, I am called. Because of his grace, right this, and also, I am loved. I am loved to the church of God in Corinth. Now, listen, 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 listen. This, this idea of being loved says that I have been given God's grace, and part of the result of God's grace is love. Notice how Paul labeled God's people. He said to the church of God in Corinth. He did not say to the church of Corinth. He said to the church of God in Corinth. Paul knows how bad Corinth is. Paul knows how bad the church is in Corinth, yet he still labels them as God's church. Woo! Listen, for all leaders, if you're a leader in any way, which, um, shape, form, or fashion, whatever system it is, we ought to learn from Paul that although people are wrong, we don't jump down their throats first. Paul celebrated them for who they were and for what they were doing before he started holding them accountable. Don't do not not hold them accountable. But understand if you want to get to the heart of the issue, learn how to celebrate people where they are. Paul called them the church of God. Very interesting. Very interesting. My dad told me, he said, son, you can attract more bees with honey than you can with vinegar. Huh. I mean, it would be amazing if the church, if we learned this little secret, 
that if we want to deal with some issues in people's lives, just don't jump down and throw this this idea of dealing with a person that that doesn't belong to the the Lord. They already know they're sinners. So they don't need the church saying, you are a sinner. You are a sinner. And you're going to hell. Well, they already know that. I mean... (laughs) I mean, offer them some grace. So Paul said, look, he said, he said, to the church of God in Corinth. It, was, it would be as if there was a, only one church in Midlothian, and, and Paul was writing, he said, to the church of, uh, of God in Midlothian. Wow. So Paul displays to them that although they are active in bringing the culture in the church, he still calls them God's church. So we got to be very careful, everybody, how we discredit people and cancel people and cancel churches out. Although we have some brother, some sister churches that that bring a lot of carnality into the church house, we got to be very careful how we put our mouths on people. All right, all right. I'll say this and we keep on moving. People always say, well, what do you think about this preacher? Okay, all right. I got an opinion about everybody. Just like you got an opinion about everybody. But instead of me offering my opinion, what does God say? You hear what I'm saying? Because we all got something. Everybody goes, well, I wouldn't, I'd never do that. Well, okay, well, you're not in that position. So we, we, we know you'll never do it because you'll never be in that position. So, that's, <laughs> so, so, so be very careful how we are so quick to cancel people because we don't like the way they're doing their relationship with God. Right, 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 right. So there are some ministries around that we can have some conversations that, that are questionable about some stuff. But there is nothing, not one church in America is doing then that's worse what the church in Corinth was doing. So be very careful how quick we put our mouths on people, on preachers and ministries and churches, you know. Uh, because, look what Paul, Paul says, this is the church of God in Corinth. So Paul gives ownership of God's church in that city. Now let's talk about this. And this is a horrible place to live if you want to live for God. Uh, there's a we'll deal with this map on uh, on Wednesday there, there, there this map just kind of describes of uh, it, it, in the days of old how Corinth was was set up and how it was it had it it, it was a place of um, military it was it was a place of um, uh, trade it was a place of high religion um, there were at least 14 different gods that were um, highlighted in Corinth uh, one of the gods was Apollo, and Apollo had a fetish for little boys. Um, there was, a, you have this, one, another priestly temple where they celebrated the, a woman god, and she, every night, she would, they, they would disp- dispense out a thousand priestesses to go out and do its bidding to raise money for this god, prostitution. There were a lot of gods going around. You know, today's time we have different monuments around different places to celebrate people of, of politics, of war, whatever it is. Well, they had monuments celebrated, and these monuments were in sexual acts. They were all over Corinth. Yet God had a church there. And the problem with the church in Corinth was the church was just as carnal as the culture. So before we jump down Corinth's throat, before we cancel Corinth out, we're on the struggle bus in America also. Because our churches may not be as bad as Corinth, but we're bad. But we have allowed carnality things of the world to infiltrate inside God's house and we wonder why the church doesn't have the power that she used to have back in the day they were in service all day long now we understand they were in service all day long because if the saints came home the master would say y'all can work so they stayed in church all day long Okay, yeah, act like I didn't know history. All right. But, But while they were there they were not just sitting around eating chicken and watermelon there was some praying going on, some worshiping going on, some fellowshipping going on, because they knew there was something about the gathering together and the corporate responsibility to fellowship and worship with God. 
So here it is. To the church of God in Corinth. I am loved by God. Now, this is, this is what kind of messes up a lot of people because we want to um, um, draw a line in God's love. Listen, you, you, you cannot draw a line in God's love. God's love is complete. God's love, is, there's not a comma in it or a period in it. God's love doesn't pause. God's love is God's love, period. Period. Now, that's hard for us Americans and Christianized Americans at that because, you know, you, you, no, I'm, I'm running. I ran out of love for them. I'm done. How can, be careful. Be careful. Be careful. How can you run out of love and God never ran out of love for you? What's your disrespectful self? How, how can we run out of love with God's people? And, and here it is. God didn't run out of love for this church in Corinth who were bringing symptoms from the culture inside the church as if trying to say, God, this is good. It works out there. We want you to get down with it too. My friends, we got to be very careful how we, that we don't become carnal in our worship to the Lord. That we don't become carnal in how we address the scriptures. We don't become carnal in how we spend time in God's word. That we make sure all that we do is to the audience of him to the greatest level that we can do it. Because God does not want carnality in his worship towards him. It must be done pure. So say back at me, I am loved. Next thing, because of grace, the text goes on to say, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people. Say back at me, um, because of grace, um, I am a citizen. Look at that, y'all. Look at that. He, 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 he says something really, really king there. To those, everybody say sanctified. sanctified. In Christ Jesus called to be, everybody say holy. holy. His holy people. Now, in the King James, it says saint. Now, the Roman Catholic Church has messed us up a little bit, this particular realm, because we think that being a saint is someone that is got to be dead. You got to die first, and then depending on what you, what somebody paid for your name to be great, then that makes you a saint. No, 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 no. If you are a child of God, you are a saint. I'm going to say it one more time. If you are a child of God, God labels you as his saint. Now, no question about that. Now, there may be a question about how you're living, but there's no question about who God calls you to be. <laughs> All right? So we got to make sure that we're not taking someone's lifestyle and labeling them per their lifestyle and not labeling them the way God labels them. And it gets sticky, right? It gets st sticky and thick right here. It gets sticky right about here uh, because we keep looking at how somebody is living and we gauge folks by how they're living, not by how they are in God's name. That's why it's hard, it's hard, it's hard. When somebody does something that we don't like, uh, we, we see them in the light of what they've done for the rest of their days instead of seeing them the way God sees them. Yet when we mess up, we want everybody to see us as God's forgiven. All right, all right, all right. Look at the text. I ain't going to make up nothing. Y'all look at him. He, he, he says to those sanctified. So what is sanctified? I'm glad you asked. Sanctified is the idea of being set apart for a purpose. So God has called you and set you apart, not for you to look down on anybody, not for you to, to see yourself as the elite biblically or spiritually. No, no, no. God has set you apart for a purpose, for a reason. And until you get into the fellowship with God and his word, you will never know the reason or understand the reason or the purpose. If you are called by God, God has set you apart for a distinctive purpose that you can fulfill here on the earth. That's why in the first way we're going to have a, a gift and assessment for, for those who want to see their spiritual gifts and a personality assessment. Because uh, sometimes it's not even about the gift, it's about your personality. You've got to put your personality in the right place. You know, because God has called you for a purpose and you won't understand what it feels like to live in the fullness of God's salvation until you pursue what God has called you to do. Huh. 
to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people. So now uh, I, I, I have been plucked out with a purpose, all right, set apart on purpose, and I'm called to be God's holy people. Uh, 1 Peter 2 and 9, it said, you are royal priesthood, a holy nation. God has set you apart. Listen, y'all, I, I, wish I, I wish I had time. They're about to start blinking out. Like, I wish I had time so we could just really deal with this aspect of what does it mean to be peculiar? You know, what, what does it mean to own my weirdness in God? What, what does it really mean for me to be different and be okay with it? I mean, what does it mean for me to really be an odd fellow or odd fellow, a, a, a fellow lady in the Lord's service? I am that we are supposed to be odd, peculiar, different. That's the calling of us. So since we are supposed to be odd, set apart, peculiar, different. We don't bring what the world says is common and natural into God's place, into God's presence. So since they already call you odd, give them a reason to call you odd. Walk in your oddness. <laughs> Accept your peculiarity. Accept who God has made you to be, that he has called you to be different on the purpose. So to our students in the sanctuary this morning, when you get back to school tomorrow, be odd. Bless your lunch in front of everybody. Ask them, hey, y'all want to bless y'all's food too? Because I want to go down right. Ask them and just pray over it anyway. Be odd. They already think you're crazy. Give them a reason to do it. Oh, you grown men in here don't want to spend time with your children and family in God's word. Shame on you. Be odd at home. Tell them y'all turn the TV off. Do it during the game they know you want to see. Show them what it means to sacrifice something. Let's be odd. Be peculiar. Be a little bit different. Why? Because we have been called to be God's holy people. And the idea of holiness is not only how we set apart, but we are set apart in morality. That we live morally proper, morally correct. Because we are holy people. The scripture says, be ye holy for Lord your God am holy. We are trying to represent God in a carnal world of what it means, what it looks like to live separately and different. All that we do is to never align up with the culture. If you align up with the culture, then you're not living on the way God wants us to live. Because everything about us is different, y'all. All of our reactions and responses are in opposition to what the world says, how we should act and respond. But I, because of grace, I am a citizen. Uh, I am a saint. Ooh, this is not to make anybody get big-headed. Don't get big-headed now. But God calls you a saint. <laughs> and well, Listen, I'm done. I'm almost done. But what I love about God is God calls me a saint even in my imperfect my imperfectness. God calls me a saint, although I've got some, 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 some ain't ways. Not long do I have some ain't ways, I got some taint ways. That's it in between. You know, I got some ways. Even in the midst of that, uh, God calls me a saint because if you're a saint, you ain't an ain't. If you ain't an ain't, you ain't a saint. It's either one way or the other. You can only be one. And even in, the, in my messed up mind and how I do some things every now and then, God still calls me his own. I don't know about you, but you, that's another reason. If, at least lift up one hand and tell God, thank you, that in the midst of me messing up, he does not unlabel me. He still labels me as his church, as his body, as his own. The text goes on to say, together with all those, everyone who called on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. So because of grace, I'm called. Because of grace, um, I am loved. Because of grace, I am a citizen. Here's another one. Um, because of grace, I am in the gathering. I am in the gathering. Look at what he says. Now, we, we know something about the gathering because we just finished talking about, oh, what a fellowship. Right, 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 right. So look, look how Paul um, talks to this church. 
that is living in carnality. Look at it. He said, together with all those, everyone who called on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, all right. So y'all walk with me. So they were not currently living it, but because they had called his name and they were a part of the church, Paul honors the gathering. There's carnality in the church, and Paul is going to deal with it. But he didn't hold the carnality they were bringing into the church against them in this moment. He yet celebrated them for their willingness to still come together. I'm going to say it one more time. Paul knows their issues. We will read to next Sunday that a representation from Chloe, Chloe's house sent Paul a letter and laid out all the things that were wrong with the church. So Paul knows the church has some issues. He knows this. But did he beat them about their issues first? No, he celebrated the fact that they were at least called and they were at least coming together. Whew. Listen, listen, listen. There is still something about us coming together. I believe that the reason why the church of Corinth wasn't all the way turned over to reprobate church it's because they were at least coming together and they were coming together under the authorship of, the, of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. So there was still a guiding source that was not allowing them to give all the way in to carnality. You see, when you don't have power by yourself, when you're not walking as strong by yourself, there's something in the gathering of God's people. That's why the writer of Hebrews says to forsake not as, as some in the habit of doing. Because something happens when I see your little bit of faith and my little bit of faith. And we start compacting that faith together. Something happens to change the atmosphere. You see this world offers you nothing towards your salvific journey. Therefore we come together and we feed off each other. We come together and we rub shoulders together. Listen, I, you, girl, you look good. You didn't feel like you look like nothing this morning. And somebody said, oh, that is, you look so pretty. Oh, me, me. Because we feed off each other. So understand when you are not a part of the gathering you're supposed to be a part of, you are limiting the power that's in the gathering in numbers. Look at what the text said. I'm making it up. He said, together. With all those everywhere. <laughs> Listen, y'all. Uh, so the, so the, the text is saying to us that he said all those everywhere. So Paul is now showing us the unity in the global church. The global church. He's not just talking about those who are in Corinth. Although, if you go back to Acts chapter 18, um, God says to Paul that there are, you have brothers and sisters there in Corinth. And, and, you know, I can see Paul's mind like, where are they? Well, they show up, you know. So it wasn't just Paul. And Paul says to the church, to all those everywhere, that listen, you may not see them. You may not know them, but God has other sons and daughters all over everywhere who are professing the same name you are professing. And could it be that maybe somebody is waiting on somebody to show some kind of light? Oh, there's some light. There, uh, and they will draw to where you are or you are draw to where they're in. But it only happens when we all live according to the name of Jesus Christ. All those everywhere. Look at the text. Number, all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I wish we had some more time. We could deal with this. Many people are, many people are calling on the name of God. And that ain't good enough. I know it's bad English. All you teachers, y'all bear with me every Sunday. I'm going to give you one more reason. It, it, ain't, it ain't English. It ain't good. It's not. We, we, just saying God, it, 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 doesn't, it superimposes nothing. It gives a blank statement. So Paul is clear. The name of the Lord, Jesus Christ. The young man that won the um, uh, M MVP uh, the other week, he... he uh, of the, for foot, the football, so that football association, he, they highlighted him. He said, I want to give thanks to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I said, come on, man, call his name. Yeah. Call, call his name, boy, on this national platform. He didn't say, I want to give honor to God. Uh-uh, uh-uh, because I got a question. Which God? Which God? Who are you talking about? What God? 
Here in Corinth, they had over 14 gods. Just giving thanks to God is like a blanket statement. Which one? He said, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, Paul is clear that the function of the church is on the auspice of the Lord Jesus Christ. So who are you performing in? Whose name are you doing what you're doing in? If it's not as the church, if it's not the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, you ought to stop what you're doing right now. Change your mind. Get your mind right because all that we do is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Finally, the text says this, um, said this to us. Look in verse number, uh, number three. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace. Um, grace and peace. So, so what we see here is that we, we see Paul um, putting together a, 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 a benediction, a closing, a blessing for the people. And he partners modern vernacular with old vernacular. So he says, grace and peace. Shalom for those that uh, understood the, the, the old language. That's what we call the old language in Paul's day. There was the old language, the Hebrew language. Shalom, peace. Uh, but he says, grace and peace. Quite interesting, right? So jot down the last piece. The last piece, the last point for the day is, I am blessed. I, 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 am, I am blessed. Paul pronounces a blessing over this carnal church. Grace and peace. Y'all see that? Grace and peace to you from our Lord, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul pronounces a blessing over the church, and he makes clear who the church is once again. Grace and peace. To you from our God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Yo, Paul is so meticulous in making sure that they understood that Paul was not recognizing them for their carnality. He was recognizing them for their saintliness. He was calling out, I know y'all got some issues. I know, but I'm going to remind you of who you are in your father's eyes. I know, I, 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 I know because I got a letter. I got a whole letter talking about all the stuff you got you wrong with. I, I know it, but I want you to understand, and I'm going to deal with the letter. I'm going to deal with the information, but I am addressing you the way God sees you. One of the hard things that we have, we have a hard time addressing our brothers and sisters the way God sees them. We address them per action. We address them per what we've read. We address them per how we feel. But we're real slow about addressing our brothers and sisters the way God sees them. <laughs> Yet, we want everybody to address us appropriately. I'm a sinner saved by grace. Okay, what about the one you have an offense with? They're just as, just as much a sinner. They're just as much saved by grace as thee. Look, 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 look what Paul said. He's, 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 he says grace and peace. So the idea of grace and peace is, is, is that Paul acknowledges God's favor over the carnality of their lives. So God's grace is more powerful than what we can do wrong. I'm going to try the balcony. balcony. God's grace is more powerful than the sin that's even alive in our lives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It is. It is. Because it is in advance. Before we even shaped in our mother's womb, before our grandparents knew who they were, grace had already been exposed to the world so there is nothing that we can do or say that will ever diminish the power of God's grace you see when God's grace is exposed it's exposed in love and forgiveness when grace is exposed it's exposed in love and forgiveness how can I say that because Jesus is the result of God's grace exposed to us in love and forgiveness. Grace had nothing to do with what we're going to do. 
Grace is God's gift to us that is exposed to us in love and forgiveness. Listen, uh, uh, um, that's why you can own the fact that I am blessed. Because in spite of our idiosyncrasies, in spite of our carnal thoughts and behaviors, grace has still been exposed to us. In spite of our stinking thinking, we can still declare that I am blessed. Why? Because I am the recipient of God's grace. <laughs> in my crazy manners, my crazy ways, I can still go to bed at night knowing that I am covered by God's grace. God's grace in the simplest form is described as his unmerited favor. So grace says, I am guilty of everything, but I am also covered by the one who can cover it all. God gives us grace. And I know we love the fact that the text says morning by morning, new mercies we see, but also morning by morning, grace is exposed over us. Because all of us are guilty of something because we all are ex-somebody. And some of that behavior can still rise up. And when it does flare up, God's grace is still there to put it out. So as we know, we've dealt with the, um, some fires there in the panhandle this past week. And it's been labeled now as the worst fire of destruction in Texas. It has been labeled as the second worst fire of destruction in American history. Over 1.1 million acres in the panhandle destroyed. Destroyed. But it will take some time before that land can be used. Uh, cattle no longer have a place to graze because over 1.1 million acres now destroyed. Livelihoods for farmers are now gone for a while. Could it take a little while for that land to rehabilitate itself so it can start producing uh, again? They, they lost cows where literally they, the, 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 um, the report says that some of the farmers shot their cows so the cows wouldn't suffer by being burned up. Livelihoods now just, just, just destroyed. One thing about it that I realized, though, is, is that um, what they needed... To put the fire out was water. And because there was no water around, it would not have mattered how the water arrived. They just needed water. It, it, it doesn't matter. They were in such a dire state. People's houses going up in flames in less than 10 minutes. Barely had time to get out. All they needed was some water. And it would not have mattered if the truck came from Midlothian, Amarillo, El Paso, Grand Prairie. There were trucks from all over, um, the, all over Texas that went to the panhandle to help put these fires and to add insult to history, to, to insult to what was going on, two um, fires came together to make it so horrible. But all they needed was some water. It wouldn't have mattered if the, if the, if the tank came from Nacogdoches. They just needed some water. It wouldn't have mattered if it was a new fire truck or old fire truck. They just needed some water. I'm closing this morning just to remind you that it does not matter how the package is put together. It does not matter if you're strong in your articulation, strong in your rhetoric, um, looking the part. It does not matter what the church needs. It's for those of us who are saved by God's grace to love on the church and pour out on the church some living water. Yeah. There, 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 there are some things we got to contend with. 
Because this church in Corinth was in a bad situation. But what they needed to hear from Paul being an apostle, Paul being God's man, was not to be beat over the head because of their sin. They needed, first of all, to be poured out some love on them. So listen, there, there, there are some people that you go to church with every Sunday. There are some people in the neighborhood around you that you know they have given their lives to Christ, but they're not living according to the truth of God's word. So they got some carnality that's, that's creeping up. Yeah, they already know us, so and what they need to hear from you, they need to experience the true water of God's word. They need to know that God still loves them, and God is giving them time and opportunity to get it together and pull it together. But they need to know from you that although you are living foul, although you are trying to make God con uh, uh, condone your sin, God still loves you. I I'm done, but one of the great writers... Um, the one I love to read, I, I, his name just escapes me now because I don't have my notes in front of me. He, 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 C.S. Lewis is the C.S. Lewis. In one of the books that he writes, uh, that he wrote, it, it, it's, it's about two demons. And one demon is a mentor to the other demon. And so the, the young mentor demon is trying to figure out how, how do I, how do I, how do I uh, get this person? He calls himself a Christian. How, how, how do I get him? So the old mentor demon said, listen, the, your problem is you're trying to do it in, 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 some, in some ways that are unconventional. You see, the problem with, with those that call themselves a Christian is that they think that it's God and something else. So if you can convince them that it's God and, then you got them. All right, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> the problem with many of us, we, we are convinced that it's God and something else. We're convinced that that is God plus a behavior system. We're convinced that that is God and my rhetoric. because God and me knowing a whole lot of scripture. No, 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 no. It's God and God alone. That is the water message that we must tell the world that it's not God and baptism. It's not God and speaking in tongues. It's not God in the right church. It's God and God alone. And because it's God and God alone, there are no superficial things that man can add to it. It's God. God brings about his grace. God exposes his grace in love. God gives us a brand new opportunity. It's God and God alone. So now we all can declare, I may be messed up, I may be jacked up, but I am blessed by God. And there is nothing anybody can say to diminish who God has blessed me to be. We are God's people and in the midst of our mess God still offers us grace God's grace has covered every sin that we could think of and the ones that ought to come his grace is exposed to all of us so now the question is am I going to lean in this carnal way or am I willing to live in the true disclosure of God's grace over my life we're not going to condone any sin. But I realize to get you to deal with your sin, I got to love on you first. I, got, I realize if, I, if we're going to deal with some root, it, rooted issues in our heart, I need to bless you first. So just like there are people in your sphere of influence, the people in your life, as the body and the voice of Lord Jesus Christ, let's love on them first. You see, because on next Sunday, it's going to get real stick. It's going to get real ugly, real crucial. Because Paul got to deal with some things. Because all the things that the, the city of Corinth was doing, the church of Corinth was doing it too. In the church. Save, sanctify, fill the Holy Ghost, and that with fire. All that, all that, all that, all that. And live in carnal. But there's something about the blessing that Paul gives from the beginning that gives him entry to speak to all of those issues the church had. So I'm done. But let me ask a question. Are, are you so steeped in who you are on Sundays that you're not willing to expose the grace of God to people in their lives? Yeah, we got, we got to hold people accountable to the truth. There's no, no, no question about that. But are they open to hear the truth from you? Father, we thank you on today for 
the clarity of the call of the calling upon our lives that we don't have a heaven or a hell to put anybody into. We can never speak to the end of your love or the end of your grace because it doesn't end. It never ends. So, Father, we thank you that by us owning who we are in you, you give us the opportunity to speak to our brothers and sisters. And even Paul has to put somebody out the church. But he does it in grace. He does it in love. Because it's about the unity of your children, Father. So, Lord, we thank you that we have been blessed by you. And because of that, we ask you now to fill our hearts, Father, because we want to love on our brothers and sisters in an accountable way to you. So as we go through this book of Corinthians and we address the faults of Corinth, we're not the same city as Corinth. America, one city in America is not as bad as Corinth. You put a San Francisco together with a New York together with a Midlothian, we look just as bad. You put a Waxahachie together with a, with, with, with a Salt Lake City, with a Dallas. We're on our way to being just as bad. So the clarion call is not for those who are outside the faith. The call is for those who call on the name of the Lord. To live in such a way. That's not only pleasing to you, but that's drawing for those on the outside. That they'll want to know, what must I do? That's the question they ask Peter. What must I do to be saved? So, Father, we thank you for the, the calling of us. Thank you for the choosing of us. Thank you for the citizenship we have in your kingdom. Thank you for the blessing that you have given to all of us. And so we love you and we thank you. So, Father, as we sit here this morning preparing ourselves to leave this place, we lean on the blessing that we have in you. And we thank you. For we are blessed in the city and in the fields as we come and as we go. So, Father, as we leave this place, but never from your presence, we, we walk out of here today knowing that you have called us, you have selected, you placed us in a place for a reason. So we go forth this morning to tell this dying world where they can get this spiritual water tell this dying world where they can have this same blessing upon their lives. If you've never given your life to Christ, it's my prayer today that you would take advantage of this moment. That you will own Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior, even as your friend. And if you have accepted Christ as your Savior, but you know you're not living up to the truth of God's Word, that you will um, turn from that way of thinking and turn completely to the Lord. Maybe the call for you is the call to, uh, to ministry. God is calling you to step out and do some things that he hasn't spoken to anybody else the way he's spoken it to you. You've got to do it. You've got to do it and do it now. No more the season is over for passivity. The season is over for letting somebody else. No, no, no. God has made a calling up on your life, and you've got to fulfill it. Father, thank you for the calling. Thank you for the equipping. Thank you for the blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. May the Lord lift his counsels upon you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name. Everybody sing bless, 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 bless. I'm waiting on you, bless, bless, bless. Oh, we're blessed, we're blessed in the city, we're blessed in the fields, we're blessed when we come, and when we go. We cast down every stronghold. For the devil is. Stay.
in the fields When I swim we come and when we go We pass down every struggle And poverty must cease For the devil is defeated We are blessed Alright listen, 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 listen It's my prayer that you walk out of here this morning Knowing that God's love will never fail his grace over your life will never cease. Yet there is a demand on your life to live according to God's scripture. And if you need prayer about that, we'd love to pray with you. But walk out of here knowing for sure God has expectations of all of us. There are people that God has uh, given them an ear to hear our voices. And God will send you out as accountability, as love to represent him. But make sure your heart is right so what you have to say will be received. The world around you wants to know the truth. But they will only receive it from a, from a source that they respect. Walk out of here in God's blessings. But let's get the job done. Have a great day. We'll see you on Wednesday. We're blessed in the city. We're blessed in the fields. 